Merci Jacques de cette introduction si bienveillante et même flatteuse. And now I go to English. Uh, I'd like first to, uh, to take advantage of my position here to uh, reply to the question that was raised by Dennis uh, about these, uh, the uh, pro proliferation of so-called rights. And I just, the point I wanted to make is this, that those who advocate these rights, which would be, of course, positive rights requiring people to do something, present them as if uh, they were added onto the uh, set of negative rights. So they speak as if uh, they were saying the following. Well, you, we've got all these negative rights. Isn't that wonderful? Now let's add on these positive rights to them. But of course, uh, uh, people as intelligent as you uh, know full well uh, that these are not additions to the negative rights that people have, but they are subtractions from the negative rights that people have. My positive right for you to do something for me uh, contradicts your negative right not to do something for me. And so I think that's an important thing to understand because it pulls the rug out from under the suggestion that they are uh, adding on to our rights, whereas they are in fact uh, diminishing those all important negative rights. Uh, I want also to uh, underline my agreement with uh, the previous uh, speakers, uh, Doug Rasmussen and uh, Father Sirico, uh, I was hoping to find something to disagree with. I'm very disappointed, but that's the price you pay, I guess. Uh, let me begin by uh, raising the uh, question as to why there has been a, at least a seeming uh, conflict between the uh, Catholic Church and uh, classical liberalism. Why so many uh, Catholics of, in important positions have viewed it with uh, a certain amount of, of suspicion. Uh, there are several reasons why this has happened. One, of course, goes back to the uh, French Revolution itself, uh, which not only uh, fought, was, which was not only waged in order to assure human liberty, but was also at least among many of its protagonists, an anti-Catholic uh, group. And Catholics uh, found it difficult psychologically to uh, separate the wheat here from the chaff. They did not see that the uh, the libertarian aspect, the freedom aspect of the French Revolution was separable from the anti-religious aspect. Uh, they also considered, they also had the belief that if you were a liberal, you were also a moral relativist. And they rightly, in our opinion, were opponents of relativism. And finally, you had the problem of economic ignorance. Uh, much of the economic knowledge 
that had been developed within the Catholic Church during the late medieval and Renaissance period was forgotten as a result largely of the French Revolution, but partly also of the uh, abandonment on the part of Catholics of scholastic philosophy. Another problem was that much of this rich development of economic thought uh, had been had taken place in Spain, and uh, Spain was uh, ceased in one sense to be a part of Europe at a, at a certain period in history, and so there was very little, uh, very little contact. Uh, you may, uh, if you ever get the chance, you ought to look at the book which was written by uh, Alejandro Chafuen on that, uh, the doctrine of, of distributive justice in, the, uh, in that period. And many modern Catholics would be very much surprised at some of the points that these people were making. And they're very uh, sophisticated grasp of economic uh, principles. So, uh, so much then by way of uh, explanation, not by way of justifying it, but uh, as the Tolstoy said, to comprendre c'est to pardonner. As you've already heard, one of the accusations against uh, classical uh, liberalism is the, that it is guilty almost of, a, of almost a Hobbesian individualism. The idea that of the war of each against all and the idea that what the state does is to bring about a truce in this war of each against all. This, of course, is quite different from the Lockean concept of the state of nature, uh, in which human beings are essentially social beings, beings who cannot survive except in virtue of their ability to cooperate peacefully with each other. I think Hayek, it was Hayek that made the point that uh, the Hobbesian position is ultimately untenable uh, simply because if it were, if it had been true, there'd be no one around today to talk about it. Uh, Locke's opinion was that the the normal situation for humankind is a situation in which they uh, live at peace with one another, where criminality is the exception rather than the rule. Uh, there's absolutely nothing in classical liberalism uh, that suggests or lends credence to the idea that we are anything but a, uh, but social animals. Uh, Marx one time made the correct uh, judgment uh, that 
that the individual is the social. And it's not a question of are we individuals or are we social beings, but we are individuals who essentially live in relationships uh, with other uh, people. The uh, topic, the explicit topic of this talk is the, is the common good and social justice. I'd like to begin by trying to spell out what the uh, common good is not. Some people would, have, would distinguish the, what is good for the members of society from what is good for the society. Mrs. Thatcher one time said that there is no such thing as society. A proposition that needs to be distinguished, I think. She was right in saying that society is not a thing. That it is not a thing over and above the members of society. The expression was unfortunate in that it gave the, at least suggested to some people that we were not social animals, that our social aspect was not important, which of course it is, and I don't think she disagreed with that. But it's certainly the case that when you have all the members of society, you've got society. You don't have the members of society plus society. A collection and society is one kind of collection, uh, is not an entity that is over and above the things that are collected. It is the collected things having a certain relationship with uh, each other. Uh, to suggest that, that collections were entities over and above the collected, ent collected items would in fact entail an infinite regress. That could be shown as follows. Suppose you have a, have a collection of two beings. Now, if the collection itself is an entity, we now have the two beings plus that collection. And so we have a collection of three beings now. Now, of course, if the collect that collection is over and above the things collected, we immediately have another collection uh, giving us four beings, and there's no way of calling a halt to this uh, process. Well, uh, why am I doing this? Is it to uh, demonstrate that I am a philosopher? Well, yes, that too. But not only that, uh, it is to, it is, I'm bringing it up because it's relevant to this idea of the common good. If the only things that there are, are individuals, then <clears throat> the only things for which something can be good, or for that matter bad, are individuals. So if there is a, a common good, that common good is a good for the individuals. The question is not whether 
we go for goods for individuals as opposed to uh, the, a common good, but rather what we have to show is that this common good is in fact a good for individuals. And I prefer to speak, not use the phrase, not the common good, but rather the good in common. The good that is common to each individual in the society, rather than a good for some imaginary whole that is over and above and transcending uh, the individuals. And by the way, the common good has to be a good. Uh, I say this because people are always uh, speaking of the common good as if it were some sort of Moloch that to which we have to sacrifice for us. The only time the common good ever gets mentioned is to, uh, is to explain to you why you can't have something. Well, what kind of good is that? Now, the scholastics, scholastic ethicians correctly my opinion, identified the uh, common good as peace and prosperity. And they looked on this as a condition for all other goods. They weren't saying that peace and prosperity was not a good for the individuals in society. But what they were saying, it is a good that all of us need to have if uh, we are to have these other goods. Uh, I already suggested that they brought up, mentioned the remark of Hayek that if the Hobbes theory of nature had been true, none of us would be around to uh, discuss it. Uh, all of us are in need of this uh, good of peace and prosperity. And oddly enough, oddly enough, even those people who do things which uh, militate against the common good, the marauder, the, the thief, uh, can flourish only in a society uh, where most of us aren't thieves. The thief is parasitical on the non-predatory activities of the rest of mankind. Otherwise, there wouldn't be anything to steal. And so, even people like that are forced to opt for a type of society in which the cards are stacked against uh, their activities. In other words, we can't all, uh, we can't all be thieves. Uh, so it's a, uh, <clears throat> in other words, those who would deny that this was a good are subject to the Aristotelian uh, retortion that they're forced to affirm the very good they would uh, fight against. Well, the pursuit of the common good requires uh, cooperation, the cooperative activities of human beings. Since man is a social animal, since most of us cannot go it alone. We are, all of us, in need of the cooperation of our fellow human beings. And the question is how this uh, cooperation is to be obtained. And the liberal position 
has always been is that it is uh, to be obtained by individuals in that society persuading other individuals to cooperate. So we have such groupings as the family, we have trade, we have all those things in which a people in are pursuing their own ends, <coughs> are furthering the ends of other human beings. One of the wonderful things about uh, uh, the free market is the extent uh, to which it makes free riding a possibility. We have Certain economists are always horrified at the thought that in some tiny corner of this universe, somebody or other is guilty of free riding. But the fact is that all of us are uh, free riders, and we are free riders. We're, we're enjoying the fruits of uh, other person's labor, which was not forced because in doing so, they were uh, pursuing their own ends. And, but in doing this, each of us uh, enriches, if pursuing our own ends in a peaceful, non-fraudulent manner, each of us uh, fulfills the ends of the, the desires of other human beings whether we are benevolent or not, as Adam Smith suggested. He, of course, was not against benevolence, but what he pointed out is that the liberal order harnesses our self-interest, thus forcing it to or tending at least to force it to serve the interests of other people. Economic theory has shown and practice has shown that the only way to get the kind of cooperation that produces peace and prosperity is by not coercing people into cooperating. Because after all, central planning, as it is euphemistically called, is coercion. You are planning, planning the lives and activities of other uh, persons, and this with or without, with or without their consent. And we see now, even if we had, been, had been unable to understand the theory sufficiently well, we have seen to what that has led in practice. Now, I think that the Arrangements of society are something that has to be chosen, even though within that framework we, we don't engage in central planning. But we have to, in other words, I want to suggest this, that not everything that comes about through uh, spontaneously is good. Uh, it's not the spontaneity that makes it good, it's what comes about. And what kind of society we have must, it seems to be, uh, to be a matter of either decision or at least acquiescence, that it is a state of affairs that requires the uh, sanction of the participants in that. And of course, we know that, that, that even 
And this is one of the things that Hume has pointed out to us, that even a tyrannical society cannot exist except uh, unless it has the, uh, unless there is the belief of a substantial number of its members that it, that it is legitimate. Uh, the, I think the Soviet Union uh, collapsed in the last analysis not because it didn't have enough uh, police people, uh, not enough soldiers, but rather because it lost the legitimacy that had been accorded to it uh, before. Finally, uh, I think my time is drawing to an end. I want to say a few words about the uh, term social justice. The, where the term is a new term, that is to say, it appeared only in the last century, and I believe the person who first used it was an Italian Jesuit named Taparelli. Uh, and it made a sort of official appearance in a en papal encyclical called Quadragesimo Anno, which uh, was the work of another Jesuit, namely Nel Broning and uh, signed by uh, Pius XI. The, uh, the uh, it's worthy of note, by the way, that Nel Brunig, who I think finally died, but uh, he, he, died only, he died only recently, and at the end of his life, he uh, noted uh, that he had a, now had a number of misgivings about what went into that, uh, that encyclical. Uh, the encyclical uses the word uh, uh, social justice, but does not, unfortunately, doesn't provide a definition of that word. And so we are left wondering what we have, uh, what we are dealing with. Uh, somebody uh, suggested the other day that perhaps this is a case of a uh, christening without an infant. The, the question, the difficulty can be put as follows. Uh, suppose you, you all know, don't you, what commutative justice is where each person gives to the other what is due. In other words, you live up to your contracts, you don't steal, you pay your debts, that sort of thing. Uh, that is uh, what is due that each person owes to the uh, other person. Now, imagine a world in which uh, every act is an act in accordance with uh, a commutative justice. Well, if that is the case, is there, some, is there something lacking to justice? Is there some other kind of justice that needs to be added on? Is there some other just act that is left out of the reckoning? And I think the, pro the problem is that this, uh, people find it difficult to find uh, these acts. Well, is there, is there some sense in which uh, we can uh, allow that uh, term to uh, be used. I think we can if we regard social justice not as another kind of act, but rather as a state of affairs. We can speak of a just society meaning a society uh, in which uh, just acts are favored and unjust acts are disfavored, and a society that is organized in such a way as, as to make that possible. So we could speak then of a 
just society and use the word social justice in that sense to say that social justice obtains uh, where you have a society uh, in which the common good which is obtained and the common good of course is obtained by the practice of justice. Now just to end this, how, how is this practice of justice to be, uh, to be obtained in, in the good society? Well, again, to go back to the Middle Ages when you, or the, the, the Renaissance there when these uh, Catholics were, were moral theologians, uh, were, were talking about economic problems, one of the things they railed against was the privileges that existed in the society of that day, enabling, uh, enabling people to do that which, if done by anybody else, would be criminal actions, to seize the, seizing, the, seizing the wealth of others. And they pointed out that this sort of thing, especially when it took the form of heavy taxation, was destroying the, was destructive of the uh, prosperity of society and also of its peace. Uh, tampering with the currency was something that they reprobated. The failure of a society to be peaceful and to be prosperous has been largely, the, in no small degree, the result of uh, interventionism. What are some of the, the why has the welfare, why for example has welfare become uh, such a problem? Mostly because of interferences in the labor market. People are in need of welfare mostly because of unemployment. The fact that they are unable to get employment. They are unable to obtain employment because <clears throat> their earning power is not sufficient to justify the minimum salary that is permitted, permitted uh, by the by the state, and so that means it's not worth anyone's while to employment to employ them, and so they they are victims. Uh, we know that in we know that in the Union of South Africa, this policy of imposing uh, minimum wages was imp was deliberately put there in order to disemploy uh, non-whites. It wasn't that the people who did this were ignorant of economics, they understood it all too well. Uh, the best way to ruin somebody is to uh, make it impossible for that person to market his or her goods and services. Because that's the only way in which we can expect others to give us things if we can give if we can exchange our goods and services for them so to make it impossible for these people to do these things is to <coughs> make it impossible for them to uh, flourish uh, humanly uh, well i think we can leave the rest of the questions I have to apologize to Father Sadowski to have asked to shorten this speech. 
but we have uh, still uh, some more by the grass mission. And don't forget that uh, we will discuss also, and we can uh, uh, intervene again, with the lecture of Angelo Petroni on the morality of welfare states. So we, we could uh, take more uh, precision on this point. Uh, Doug, some short comments, please. Yeah, I have some very brief comments. Uh, one of the things that you should be aware of that's happening here is that you are being presented this morning with uh, some new ways of thinking about liberalism. And this is important that you pay attention to this because the critics of liberalism are, keep on saying certain things over and over again. One is quite often as they say that liberalism assumes that human beings are atoms, that we don't live together with or among others. False. Everyone up here has been arguing just the opposite. And in fact, in my paper, it is the sociality of human beings that makes rights necessary. If we were not social beings, we wouldn't need such a concept. Furthermore, every one of us has, object, has uh, embraced the idea that morality, moral knowledge is possible, that the good can be something objective. So none of us are libertines, subjectivists, or ethical relativists. Yet we all find liberty central to the political order. Father Sadowski has just gone through, in a quite marvelous way, really, a discussion of the concept of the common good of the political community. Normally, when people hear the common good of the political community, what you want to do is grab your wallet and run for your life. The concept is meaningful if properly employed, employed in such a way that remembers that individuals are ultimate and we're talking about relationships. Furthermore, the notion of justice is something that a liberal can use, but justice understood as a virtue and justice understood as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an entire structure of a political system, which Father Sadowski called peace and order, which I, called, which I defined in terms of a theory of rights. Finally, uh, my comments, I'll end my comments with something I learned from uh, another Jesuit, Father Francis Wade at Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He was fond of the story of talking about someone who was limited in their medical ability. They learned how to do an appendicitis, how to take out an appendicitis. Therefore, when anyone came to them for assistance, all they knew how to handle was an appendicitis. So everyone who came to them had an appendicitis. <laughs> Many people, when they learn one truth, be it in ethics or politics or economics, assume that that one truth answers all questions. Sorry, that's not the case. And what we've been talking about this, this morning is the ways of placing, well, well at, least, at least what we think are some important truths, in, in different orders, so that you understand that economics answers one set of questions, that virtues a answer another set of questions, that rights after an answer another set of questions. And if you want to begin to understand and defend liberalism, you've got to remember that there are many distinctions and many answers. Thank you. Thank you.